be recording what we do from this point forward for uh, posterity here <laughs> and so others might be able to <clears throat> enjoy um, the conversation as well. So good morning. Uh, did I update my name? Yes, Sally Brown here and I'm so glad to have this opportunity to, to, um, to share some from what I was learning from the book and other kingdom. Um, I was really grateful to be introduced to this. I am, I have always deeply loved um, studying human behavior and trying to understand why we think the way we do and how people come to different perspectives in the world. And one thing I had really been grappling with was our discontent and why we are so deeply discontented. And this book for me um, made some connections um, that I had just never considered before and, and connected, it was, there was intersectionality as they say, between what I was reading here about some of the way, ways we were set up as an economic system, as a culture, and um, some of the other things that we're grappling with, um, including the pandemic and um, racism. Um, all of that kind of tied in here. So I'm really grateful for the opportunity to have um, read the book and now to discuss it with you. Um, so I am going to now share my screen. We are going to do two things called word clouds. Um, and word clouds, you, you may be familiar with them. These are where as people add words into their devices, this is, oh, how come that just popped me into, now you're seeing the... There we go. Are you seeing the big screen saying, in a word, what is the American way of life? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, you may enter as many single or small phrase um, answers to this question. <laughs> we'll, let it, we'll let it go until it kind of dies off here. I'm going to start reading some of those so prosperity and opportunity, happiness, safety, possibility, freedom, but also money centered, greedy, selfish, materialism, my personal way, materialistic. Give it a second, see if there's any more. Mass consumption, competitive, open. Okay. Wow, this is really good. Really good. Anybody, anybody want to offer anything as you're looking at these words come up here? Anything stand out to you? One more, I think. One more. Lost. Caring. There are extremes. Extremes. They are extremes. So opportunity is the one word that seems to have gotten more than one submission on it. There's so much promise in this, right? The American way of life has so much promise on the one hand, and then we see the opposite of this coming through in the words that you all have, have uh, submitted um, that are perhaps the parts that we were not anticipating um, from this way of life. Masking some loss, competitive, selfish, fortunate, isolated. Wow, yeah, right? They are extremes. You know, Sally, I wonder what this word cloud would have been a year ago. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. All right. So with this in mind now, I'm going to ask you to go to the next question. So you're still on mental. Oops. Let's see. Where did I go? 
There we go. My next question should be, if I'm navigating properly here. In a word, what is the promise of free market consumerism? <laughs> what is the promise? What are we expecting from it? Access, wealth, comfort. Choice. Improvement. Hi, are you right, Travis? There. Have you ever heard any innovation? Choice, improvement, efficiency, power, comfort, personal expression, convenience. How about profit? I don't see it on the screen. Oh, did I just say that word without it being actually there? Maybe I was thinking it. What kind of profit? <laughs> Which of, what's the spelling, Ajit? <laughs> P-R-O-F-I-T. <laughs> not, not the other kind, huh? <laughs> that you are. <laughs> Okay, right. So, so this thing it, from one angle looks to be really great. Like who wouldn't want this, right? Look at all this stuff. Great. We get to do personal expression. We, we find comfort. There's, there's innovation and improvement from this. You know, certainly we get convenience. You know, I think back to when I was a child and, and really actually wasn't even that long ago that blue laws were in place and Sundays you did not, you know, you were lucky if you could find an open gas station. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But it really was a day that we were with family and and rest of we stayed, we laid low or we visited people um, instead of out spending our money. Um, so our choice was limited, but it, it, it uh, definitely influenced the way we spent our, our time. Um, entrepreneur, entrepreneurship, improvement, access, advancement, personal expression. Anything uh, anybody wants to point out on this one? Well, I mean, as the question prompted, we we're calling out the things it's promising, not necessarily the things it delivers. Correct. <laughs> so correct. It does, it does paint a very rosy picture. Sure it does. Anything else? All right. So now I'm going to take you to a third question. And this one's a little different. We're not doing a word cloud here. We're going to do, um, these are going to be more like, um, bubble conversation bubbles. So you can use phrases um, in this or sentences. So what does it mean to be like Christ? What does that look like? Mm. No. Sally, did you get mine? Oh, did you put something in the chat? Uh, I sent you a word, one word only. Oops, Inimitable. Oh, um, say it one more time, please, Ajit. Inimitable. Oops, yeah, my, my dog is harassing me here. Ajit, I'll have you spell that for me, because when I'm presenting, I can't spell. I-N-I-M-I-T-A-B-L-E. Did it pop up? Where'd it go? Um, 
Okay, so we're kind of winding down here a little bit. So we've got to forgive, to welcome the other, to think of others, care especially, care about others, especially those on the margin, compassionate, to choose vulnerability, place the needs of others in the group ahead of our own, speak truth to power, be faithful, love, selfless, see and hear beneath the surface and the obvious, serve the greater good, compassionate, um, I feel like there's probably more here that I am not scrolling to. So if you put in other words here, I'm trying to see if I can get down to the lower, to the other, oh, there we go. Okay, inimitable, um, hope beyond the present with the cosmos perspective, faithful, sacrifice, love thy neighbor as thyself, and understand the spiritual danger presented by money occasionally be weirdly secretive <laughs> oh i'd love to hear more except that apparently it's a secret <laughs> okay that one was me and i was just thinking about the messianic secret and how especially in mark jesus doesn't seem to want to tell people he's the messiah and it's kind of weird <laughs> It's it's the it's uh, to me that's the notion of um, 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 instead of promoting instead of promoting oneself, just leading by example, right? Right. Um, yeah. So so now I'm just going to have you briefly comment, and then I'm going to share some more from the book Another Kingdom. But um, gosh, oh golly, did we see much intersectionality between these and the two word clouds? Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I see one word here that definitely showed up in two places, which was caring. Mm -hmm. That was American way of life. What else are you observing? Well, more words give you a, a opportunity to be a, a little more nuanced. So maybe that's why they don't, you know, maybe there are larger issues that align rather than specific words. Except, of course, we were talking about capitalism in the other ones. Mm -hmm. Not the same focus. I see, <clears throat> I see the word other pop up quite a bit. Welcome the other, care about others, something like that. Mm -hmm. Place the needs of others ahead of your own. Selfless, right? So I, I guess for me, what's, what's clear is the, about being an American, there, there's the optimistic focus of American versus what we might feel today. And what we might feel today is very different from being like Christ. Maybe that's why these don't overlap terribly much. Okay. Oh, Anne, you're on mute. I could hey. feel her wisdom, but I couldn't hear it. <laughs> I thought you were ignoring me. Um, <laughs> I, I see more verbs in this one, and there were more nouns in the other two, hmm. um, which is hugely powerful hmm. to me, regardless of the words themselves, just speaking grammatically. Hmm. Stuff versus action. Exactly, Mark. Wow, that's like between my eyeballs hit me. Wow. Nice. Wow. All right. Well, thank you for doing so. I'm actually going to save these slides and I'm going to embed them into the PowerPoint presentation that I'm going to switch to now so that that'll be available. Um, and we will not forget all of this good work that we did. Um, and now I'm going to take you to my presentation, I hope. So we're finished with this website? We are finished with Menti. So thank you. And I, I, I admire that you all. Um, that was very fun. Isn't that good? Uh, yeah. Engaging, right? All right. So now here we are. Hopefully you are now seeing my back on the PowerPoint slide and we are on my title screen. Does that look right? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Right. So mostly I'm just going to share really just a little bit. This is not going to be a deeply philosophical presentation from me. I just wanted to share a couple of the um, of 
things from the book that really stood out to me on the issue of privatization, because that was like a lightning bolt for me reading this book. I'm like, oh my goodness, this, I've never heard this before. I didn't know this before. And it explains so much. So I'm going to highlight a couple things and then really just send us into small breakout groups to do a little discussion um, and sharing back with the larger group. So, all right, so how did we get to this notion of or where we are today? So Betty, you called it out kind of, we, we our, our notion of being Christ-like versus our notion of what it means to be an American or the impacts of being in the, in the society that we're in. Um, how did we get here? So this from the foreword to another kingdom really stood out to me. Yeah. Enclosure is a place to start to deconstruct the free market narrative. Before the enclosure movement began, there were in the British Isles and elsewhere extensive public lands, lands on which local residents could create a life and livelihood, common land on which to fish, farm, hunt, and be housed. Enclosure actively began in the 16th century and reinforced by James I, fenced in public lands and made them private. There were protests and battles over the years, but after a couple of hundred years, virtually all the public lands went into private ownership. The landless working class became labor to serve the machine, and the land went to feeding sheep, more profitable than feeding people. The end result was a culture ordered by private interest. Commerce became married to king. What was produced was a culture that abandoned some subsistence living and the values of local economy. It became a market devoted to scale, speed, and cost. A market that sanctified buying and selling, a culture where place, history, and tradition became, oops, there's a typo for me, became irrelevant. A market culture based on contracts and void of covenantal relationships. So it's obvious that this is from the foreword. Um, if, uh, for those who may not yet have had a chance to read the book, it starts off with a bang. Um, this grabbed me right away and uh, made me wanna tear through the rest of the book. So this goes on, um, the next concept that gets covered in the book is the concept of the four pillars of the free market consumer ideology, which is, which is uh, part of what we covered in our word cloud. Um, the impacts of that or the, the uh, kind of frame frame of reference that we have. So here they are. The first one is scarcity. Um, if you think about it, markets work when the market thinks that things are scarce, right? Scarcity drives up price and profit. Um, certainty, we all hear that all the time. The markets love certainty. And, and what do we mean by the markets? Anybody want to throw out the answer on that one? What are the markets? You mean the financial, like the financial markets? Amen. Yep. The stock markets, the financial yep. markets, right? Not necessarily my certainty, but the, not yeah. the financial <laughs> certainty, but the financial markets, the institutions. There's perfection, right? This, this notion of perfection is the ideal goal. Mm -hmm. And then finally we have privatization and it's really privatization that, that uh, grabbed my attention first and foremost. That's a little different than faith, reason, and tradition. You think? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, Mark, that struck me as well. Yeah, so here's, so here also from chapter one of Another Kingdom, we have this definition about privatization. So free market system is addicted to privatization. If it is not for profit, if it's government, oh, if it is a not for profit, if it's government, if it's schools, we have to make it more like a business. And so we have to be privatizing for about two, we have been privatizing for about 250 years, which means we have diverted resources from the common good and put them in the private sector. The privatization that began with British enclosure was a violation of community. It was a removal of rights of commoner to use the land, the overthrow of the common good and the covenant we have with each other. So it is here that I would like to have us go into small group discussion and I'm going to, I'll, I'll break, oops, I'll break us into groups and then um, I will post these questions in the chat window for each small group so that you have them handy. Um, but first I would just ask that you consider what are some examples of privatization. Um, and then I've been spending a lot of time thinking about how were my views on privatization shaped. I mentioned that, you know, blue laws were in effect when I was a kid. And so 
things have definitely changed. My frame, there were not very many privatized businesses or, or um, segments of our um, communal life when I was young, right? That has evolved more recently. Um, and so I'm acutely aware of it. I don't think my children are. I don't know that they, that they understand it the same way I do because they haven't seen it. So my thoughts on privatization have evolved um, as well. What I, you know, do, I, do I think it's a good thing? Do I think it's, it's problematic? Um, what does scripture say about privatization? So, any questions? Oh, Margaret, unmute. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> In our group, we had two brilliant women there, and they're both very capable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was said, Ajit? We have people maybe people back in the in the main room here who didn't get to participate in breakouts, so let's give them a flavor for what the discussion was. Uh, so for our group, when we talked about sort of examples of privatization, we ended up spending a lot of time on uh, the school system and the push over the past few decades uh, towards, in certain areas at least, towards, you know, charter schools or um, voucher systems where money would be, money for education would be transferred from the public school system into sort of privately run uh, schools and oftentimes with this sort of, you know, as the example said, with the express model of saying that they should be run more like businesses, so. Okay, thank you. In our, what else? In our group, we, we had examples like incarceration, how that's been privatized more. That's a good but, one. but then toward the end, we started talking about politics, right? And um, the use of PACs and how more and more private money is, is coming into play. Mm. Can you say more about the um, privatization of incarceration, so of prisons? Well, that- Because that one, that one was at the top of my personal list. Oh, really? Oh, because that's what came to mind right away with all the discussion of what's happening in prisons. There doesn't seem to be any yes. oversight. That, came, that was one of mine. Um, and it just seems like more and more has become a for-profit enterprise to for these companies to, to maintain, to build and maintain all these prisons that we have. We have so many people incarcerated in this country. And, and quick question, so what drives profit? Need. Need. Demand. What was that? Demand. Demand, right, so we need volume. So if we're going to drive profit in prisons, we need lots of incarcerated people. We need more prisoners and we need efficiency, which means we have fewer services, et cetera, right? Those are the two things you can either, you can cut, cost or you can increase volume or both it's like it seems like the debate around prison systems used to be how do you balance rehabilitation versus sort of you know punishment and now it's both of those concerns have almost become secondary to how can we make it as profitable as possible and so then they just turn into you know sort of grotesque hellscapes that we have to keep <laughs> wow yeah, well, okay. Kelly, Kelly it's Marsha. Yeah, Marsha, you know, go ahead. Profit can be increased by being more efficient, and efficiency does not always mean that you're, you're uh, cutting services. It's, you know, right. government here, there's a lot, a lot of waste in government, and things are not run very efficiently at all, so those don't always go hand in hand. Thank you. Thank Marsha. Thank you for that perspective. I think that, um, during the, in the main room here, I, I was able to have a little chat with Jean too. And I said, that certainly has what, what has shaped my own view of the world is I come from a business background and have long held that there is opportunity for efficiency um, because for profit does drive innovation and efficiency. It's like kind of like the word clouds we did. There is a promise in there. The question is, does the promise live out, right? And, and how can we get the best of that? Um, without the downside. So thank you, I really appreciate that perspective. There was a third group, did you guys, what was your discussion? We started oh. complaining about uh, gated communities and I, I hope that no one 
uh, hope none of us live in a gated community, but I started by complaining about that, showing that's an extreme example. And then we were trying to find uh, a society um, which successfully focused on community spirit and community care. And we were talking about uh, Native American populations and Alaskans, and we weren't able to come up with a group that were successful at focusing on the group. Was that discussion exclusive to the United States? The world. It was globally, okay. <laughs> Talking, just talking about, you know, uh, uh, owning, owning homes here and how that drives wealth and, you know, land, homes, wealth, exclusion, um, you know, increased not reliance on others. Um, you know, where, where in the world can we emulate um, uh, communities that are relying on each other and sharing assets and uh, and land and community and serving each other's needs better than we are. Yeah, Probably thank you, Laura. <laughs> thank you, Laura. All right. We thank you. Well, that was great. I appreciate your your discussion and your sharing and, and the multiple perspectives because I do think that's that's important too that we are considering um, multiple perspectives in our own discernment. So I'm going to take us back to the presentation. Um, so Laura is currently in my, there we go. All right, so oh, let me get my gallery view out of the way here. There we go. All right, so that was our small group discussion. Now, is there another way? So this is what the book offers as a suggestion here. The commons is the modern stance for a life not centered on profit and wealth. Belief in the commons says there are resources and wealth that belong to us all. It is reversing enclosure. It is a secular political break with the commercial empire. The commons is a stance, I got lots of typos in here, stance against empire that calls for the circular flow of money for wealth to be returned to local hands for example, in hard times, it calls for money to be created by the government instead of by interest-bearing loans from the private sector. Radical, perhaps, but the Bank of North Dakota has been doing this since 1919. The whole cooperative movement is another example of an alternative to the dominant market economy. It reconstructs purpose. It says that the purpose of the business is to build community and to care for the commons. It is the alternative to privatization and empire. And that is from chapter five of An Other Kingdom. Um, so I know we don't really have time to go back into breakouts, but one thing I do wanna comment on this as well is that by presenting this, I'm in, I am not suggesting personally that, that we need to make a rush to move towards this sort of thing. I really wanna be, be, you know, I'm provoking my own thought here and saying, wow, this is quite different this notion of, of uh, what I might have called socialism, mm -hmm. right, or co even communism, um, obviously has reemerged. And, um, and what does that mean? And is that something to be feared? Does it, does it really run contrary to our American values? It's just got me thinking a lot. And I think that's really why I wanted to bring it up is just to say, Gee whiz, when I look at this, it does seem to align with my understanding of the gospel, um, but it sure doesn't align to my understanding of, of our American culture. Um, so I, I really feel suspended between the two um, and trying to figure my way through it. Um, so if we were to go into small group discussion, the questions were, were again going to be, where do you see examples of belief in common good? Um, and again, how are your views on this shaped and how have they evolved over time? What does scripture say about this? Mm -hmm. So maybe we could take, so, so I should ask um, Ann or um, Sam, how late do we usually run this? Do we have a few more minutes? Yeah, we're we, could, we, we could squeeze another five minutes in. We do want to give folks a chance to sort of move over to the main Zoom yes well and i'm the e today so i definitely oh, have to do you. that <laughs> yeah all right 
then the question is how much time do you have well i'll give it i'll give it till five after we've got just All a few right. minutes so so reactions to this on this notion of the commons and common good well my reaction is this is where the rubber hits the road Aunt Betty. what does that mean that means daily life versus spiritual life versus spiritual path. That may not be clear. Apologies. I, I mean, I'm involved in stewardship this year, you guys, so I can't help but have that be part of what I'm thinking about here. <laughs> oh. Well, actually, thank you, Betty, because here we are on in gathering of as pledges there is an example of belief that we all have in the common good yeah. that there's mm -hmm. some that there's something to which we have some allegiance or belief or covenant to use the, the word from the book covenant with a group of people who are not necessarily blood related or other ways we could be related and just say we think there's a common good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Perfect example. Timely. <laughs> <clears throat> and can that live in harmony with free market and privatization and all those things? Can we can those things exist simultaneously? I think mm. so. I, I think so. Have, have they existed simultaneously? I mean, they have for me personally. I think they can in an enlightened community. And I think Trinity is enlightened. I think that we're thoughtful people and we're responsible people. You have to remember that, you know, not all privatization is bad. And we you have to mm -hmm. think very strongly about how that would restructure society. Billions of dollars are philanthropic dollars come from um, you know, Target and Best Buy and, and right. Nike and Microsoft, et cetera. And those are going to be money that is not going to be available in some situations if you, you know, totally, you know, get rid of privatization. So um, it's, it's not like everybody's going to come to the common good and we're going to have all these resources available. We're going to mm -hmm. lose resources. Right. Thank you, Marcia. I've been intrigued by a, a, a saying of Jesus in the Gospel of John, where he says to the disciples, we are to be in the world, but not of the world. Mm -hmm. And that has always mm -hmm. said to me that there's, a, there's an edge here, a very fine sword edge of how we, we do live in the world. I mean, I don't think Jesus is calling us to calling everybody to be a hermit or a monk or a nun or whatever. Um, certainly Jesus didn't live that way. He, he rejected the Essenes who lived like that. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there's a, an edge here. Wonderful. Oh, thank you. Oh, what a great conclusion. And now we can head into our worship service, but I am so grateful and, I'm, and I especially appreciate the breadth of the perspectives on this uh, because that is the reality of our community, right? And, and my, my own perspective is not the way. <laughs> it is an evolving way that, that is working for me in the moment. Um, and so every time I get to hear from, from my fellows about how they're viewing the world and, and what makes sense to them, I, um, I hope I make better informed choices. So the adult form has been perfect for me in that way. So thank you. I did a little word cloud of my own for you to thank, thank you. you for that. Thank um, you. Thank you, Sally. Thanks, really Sally. good, Sally. Sally. Thank you. See you well in church. Okay. Thank you for the mentor. Very well done. Thank you. Bye.